Kim uh, contacted me and said she wanted me to uh, speak at this and told me that the theme was humility. The first thing uh, that I thought was, I'm going to be so fucking good at this. <laughs> um, I'm probably the most humble person that I know, and I'm going to fucking crush this. <laughs> Truthfully, it's a very odd thing to be, to be asked to, uh, to talk about humility and simultaneously presume that uh, you know what you're talking about and have something to say. It's kind of a, an odd tightrope walk. You are um, an intimidating and attractive group. Uh, <laughs> Kim described Lane as, uh, from Braintree as the person with the awesome hair and glasses. As far as I'm concerned, that could be about half of you. <laughs> so uh, it's <laughs> lovely to see you. Uh, I'm just going to kind of talk about the art form that I love and that I practice, which is uh, improvisation and sketch comedy, and uh, how sort of in, in thinking about this through, through kind of the lens of humility, I think that uh, being humble is a, uh, a true cornerstone uh, to this art form that I love and practice. Just to get an idea, uh, how many people have seen some Chicago improv or sketch comedy? OK, cool. So maybe I don't have to explain exactly <laughs> what this is. Um, but uh, I truly feel that uh, to improv specifically, and I'll make an argument to comedy in general, that uh, humility is, uh, is a key virtue to, uh, to practice. Quickly about me, uh, I was born and raised in the state of Vermont and uh, grew up and was always interested in comedy, but didn't exactly know what shape that expression would take. I loved being on stage, I would, you know, it would be in plays, I tried to do uh, stand-up comedy. It wasn't until I was in college that I discovered this um, incredible, joyful thing called improv comedy. Um, watched it from the audience and then became a practitioner of it. And to me, it's the, the greatest, most exhilarating art form. I know some of you have probably seen some really bad improv shows. They are out there. <laughs> Few things are worse than bad improv. <laughs> but I would argue nothing is better than good improv, because I really think that it is a true uh, uh, most real test of someone's skills. When I see uh, a stand-up comic or um, a, you know, a sitcom on TV or a sketch that's pre-written and I see like a perfect joke or a perfect moment, I'm very, very appreciative of that. But I also know that that moment could be the product of months of honing that joke um, by you know, tens of people in a room trying different iterations. I have a ton of respect for that process, right? But when I see a perfect joke or a perfect moment on stage uh, in improv, I know that that came right from that moment. And I think there's nothing more exhilarating or wonderful than that. And I do think uh, that an actor's humility is where that stuff comes from. So I was in college and I started doing a little bit of improv, totally fell in love with it. And by the time I was uh, ready to graduate, it was really the only thing I could think of uh, wanting to pursue and, and do with my life, as crazy as that seems. So uh, I, you know, born and raised, spent my entire life in the state of Vermont. Having only been to Chicago one time for two days, I decided to move halfway across the country and study at uh, Second City and Improv Olympic and other places that I had heard of here. And I kind of haven't looked back since. Uh, I love it. So, in, th in thinking about this, I kind of wanted to break down 
three different kinds of humility that I think are important to improvisers and comedians, right? Um, and uh, the first one is humility in the face of your collaborators, right? Three kinds of humility. And so uh, anyone who's ever taken an improv class knows that improv, by and large, is all about letting go of one's preconceptions, right? Anyone heard of this concept of yes and? It's the way that improvisers work, right? And that is, sometimes people are literally saying the words yes and, um, but it's, it's with every line of dialogue or everything that you do, you're agreeing to and affirming the thing that the other person did and adding to that, right? It's a nice day outside. Yes, and I'm so glad that you agreed to meet me in the park. Yes, and I really think we should talk about our trial separation. Yes, and I think it's going well, brick by brick. <laughs> You are building uh, a scene, building a reality, agreeing with the thing that the person before you said or did, right? This is super important when the audience shouts a suggestion and oftentimes the cornerstone of improvisation is the two-person scene. Two people step out, they begin improvising, and it's really all about, for me, the learning curve that, that I went through when I first got here because I thought that I knew what I was doing and I thought that I was super smart and clever, right? And I got into improv classes and I was trying to prove myself and trying to plan ahead. And what I learned is that, you know, trying to stay ahead of it is actually shooting oneself in the foot and inhabiting the moment is where it's at. But it's very, very difficult, very counterintuitive. So if I were to take the stage and, um, I would say, give me the suggestion of a word or a phrase, and you would say? Snail. What did you say? Snail. Snail. OK, great. So the improv suggestion snail is thrown out, right? And I go out on stage with my uh, scene partner, and I have this idea, right? I'm going to be a waiter in a French restaurant serving escargot uh, for the first time to uh, a um, a diner that's trepidatious about eating a snail, and I'm going to convey and tell that person uh, what an incredible delicacy this is. My mind is already running super fast as to what this scene could be. I'm seeing the comic potential of the waiter who's so passionate about this food, right? Meanwhile, inside the brain of my scene partner, they're taking that suggestion less literally. They're taking that to mean a, a, a slow-paced person who is in a relationship and they want to slow down the pace of it. They don't want to break up, but they want to slow down the pace of this relationship. Two different ways to interpret this suggestion, right? My scene partner comes forward and initiates the scene before I get the chance to be the French waiter and they start talking about how they want our relationship to slow down. This is a very difficult moment for a beginning improviser, right? Because I have this French waiter idea that's fucking awesome. <laughs> but in order to do it, I have to say no in a way to what my partner has initiated, right? And that in order for me to let go of that idea, I have to practice a certain amount of conscious humility. And what I realized over time is that people think being an improviser is all about being clever and thinking quickly. It reminds me of like the, you know, the GPS on your phone, where so like I've thought about this French waiter scene and I've planned a whole route in my head, right? But the other improviser who has a different idea for that scene has just taken us on a different turn and so my GPS now has to recalculate. Like you know when you get caught in a series of one ways and it's just constantly like recalculating, recalculating. It's really exhausting for me to have to constantly do that, right? And so what I, I came to realize is that it's not to my benefit to think far ahead, which is really counterintuitive, right? Because you think uh, life is all about being prepared and making a plan and uh, thinking ahead, but improv is all about trusting that the other person that you're on stage with has an equally valid, if not more valid, idea or uh, conception of the moment that you're in that you do. Uh, I love this quote, right? Um, I'm a big Springsteen fan. Hey, asshole, the guy standing next to you is more important than you think he is. 
This is uh, Bruce talking after he reunited the E Street Band. At the end of the 1980s, Bruce Springsteen dissolved his legendary band, the E Street Band, and decided to start making records with different bands and you know, doing solo stuff. And the 90s are kind of regarded as this lost decade for Springsteen fans because he was still writing music and making music, but um, somehow like, the magic was gone in, in some ways, even though he, he was still himself. And when he reunited the band, uh, someone asked him what the lesson was of the last 10 years, and this is what he said. Hey, asshole, the guy standing next to you is more important than you think he is. This is something that I try to remind myself when I'm on stage and I find myself getting carried away in my own ideas. The person next to you is more important than you think he or she is. Don't be ahead of it. Um, that's really, really hard when you, when you become taken with your own ideas. This French waiter scene that I thought of sounds really fun to play to me, right? But I have to not be afraid to let go of that conception um, and just say yes. Say yes in the moment to, to what the person is giving me, right? Um, so there's a second kind of humility that I wanted to talk about. Humility in the face of your audience. Um, so after I kind of became an experienced improviser in Chicago um, for seven or eight years, I then got hired to work at Second City, which is this you know, institution at North and Wells with like a 50 year history and uh, all these intimidating alumni. And what Second City does, I'm sure many of you have seen one of their reviews. Um, Second City does a, a two act scripted sketch comedy review. And then the third act of the night is totally improvised. And that third act essentially becomes the proving ground or the testing ground for the scenes that will eventually be scripted and appear in the two act review the next time that you go, right? So it's this very odd thing where you are improvising with the end goal of capturing a moment and repeating it hundreds of times. It's a different muscle to get used to. But in this, your audience becomes uh, a fellow collaborator. One of the things that we do at Second City when we're improvising in a, in a third act set is we listen to people's reactions, right? We listen to where the laughs are, and we listen to where the gasps are, we listen to where the, the silence is, and we literally record every set and every moment. And then, so when you're in the middle of a writing process at Second City, you're improvising scenes, putting them on their feet for the first time, and then you're going home and you're watching the tapes of those scenes. And you're trying to literally sometimes transcribe, take moments so that you can then present to an audience and say, all right, this is the second time we're, we're trying something. Last night we got the suggestion of snail and we um, did this great scene about uh, a relationship moving at a slow pace and we're gonna try it for you again. And you do this tens of times, sometimes even literally like hundreds of times, right? And the audience tells you where the laughs are. No show at Second City will ever open that's not funny. Um, some shows are, some reviews are better than others, right? But you'll never go see a review at Second City where the majority of the audience isn't laughing at regular intervals. Um, and the reason that is is because by the time they get to opening night, they've done those scenes hundreds of times and they know where the laughs are. But part of that means giving themselves over to the notion that the audience might be right about something that you have an opinion that you feel strongly about. And this is a hugely humbling experience to go in and have a, a conception of what you, the way you think that a scene should go and night after night have the audience not respond to it. And then have them respond to things that you didn't have as much confidence in. Um, to some degree, it's, it's, it's crowdsourcing, right? Uh, but it's not that you don't have uh, your own vision or your own idea about how that scene's going to go, but the audience becomes a, a collaborator, just like your scene partner. They let you know what's working, what isn't working, and the ability to, uh, I've, you know, I've seen, I've been in situations where it's very, very hard to put aside your own uh, selfish, egotistical vision of how something's going to go and truly put yourself uh, in the hands of that audience and listen to their, uh, to their honest feedback. Um, so, I say don't be above them, right? There is, for years I was performing 
at I.O. for uh, fellow improvisers and uh, largely audiences of improv students, people who were very savvy to the art form, people who wanted to see you essentially um, break the rules or do something really innovative or, or really different. And then all of a sudden you get hired to work at Second City and a, a lot of the folks in the audience are the demographic of my parents. Um, and so there, there are different kinds of laughs that you need to learn how to nurture. And there are definitely moments where you'll be in that room on stage at Second City and you can give in to that temptation of feeling like, oh, these people don't know what's funny. Um, and I, I always felt that whenever that, those feelings crept in, that they were always to my detriment. They were always to the detriment of the scene. Uh, having faith and trust and confidence in your audience is incredibly key, especially if those are the people that you're looking to entertain. Those are the people that, you're, that are there to, uh, to have a good time. Their, their uh, conception of what you're doing is equally valid, uh, at least equally valid, to your own. So the third area that I want to talk about is a humility in the face of your characters. Um, this is something that I think is paramount in improv and also just in comedy in general. And if there was any like piece of advice I could give to comedy today, I think we need uh, more of this. After I was done performing on the main stage, I went back to I.O. and started working with a, a troupe that I've been working with that Kim mentioned called the Improvised Shakespeare Company, and that's exactly what it sounds like, right? We take the title for a uh, play that has never been written or performed before, a title like... The Taming, of the, Shrew. the Taming of the Shrew is an existing Shakespeare play. Uh, <laughs> a title of a play that's never been heard of before, like... What's that? Where are the baguettes? Where are the baguettes would be a terrific <laughs> improvised Shakespeare play, right? We would take that title, Where Are the Baguettes? And we would form um, an entire narrative Shakespeare play around that title, right? And this whole process is generated by the characters in that play and the strong emotional wants that they have. Uh, they're objectives, if you will, what an actor would call a, an objective. Those characters want something, and if you come to see improvised Shakespeare, hopefully the first time you see a character, you will learn very quickly what it is that character wants and is striving for. They will spend the play trying to get that thing. If they get it, that want will morph and change, and they'll want something else. Shakespeare's characters are very unapologetically ambitious, right? If they are in love with someone, they will, uh, they will do anything to consummate that love. If they want revenge or they want to seize the throne, they will do anything. Uh, they, will, they will kill the king in order to, to sit in uh, the king's chair. But the interesting thing about Shakespeare's characters is Shakespeare never sends them up. Shakespeare never uh, sells them short. Great quote from my uh, favorite novelist, Philip Roth. We learn from Shakespeare that in telling a story, you cannot relax your imaginative sympathy for any character. Um, what that means to me as an actor is that I try to never make fun of the people that I'm portraying, right? Um, they might do silly things or have blind spots or um, do things that we find reprehensible, but they always do those things for a reason. The characters are, are always explained. My distinction in terms of uh, approaching comedy nowadays is that, you know, when we make fun of people, we are uh, presuming that we are better than they are, which is not a very humble approach. When we crawl inside their skin and we just try and inhabit them, whatever they do, good or bad, we are admitting that we are no better than they are, that we too have faults, that, uh, that this character is fully human. Um, and I can look around modern comedy and the things that I appreciate the most, uh, I think the, maybe the best comedy of all time, in my view, this is totally subjective coming from me, but is the, um, the UK version of The Office. And Ricky Gervais's character, David Brent, um, that, I think, is a great example of practicing imaginative sympathy because 
David Brent masquerades on the surface as someone who, or that show masquerades as making fun of David Brent. By the time you reach the end of that arc, you realize that that show is actually uh, a totally heartbreaking and sincere peek inside of David Brent's soul. Um, and so I came to a place where I began to appreciate this kind of work more and more and more. And I think there is a trend in comedy, particularly with the pace of the media, Twitter, all that, that we tend to make fun of people, we tend to paint them in two dimensions, as opposed to trying to represent them three-dimensionally. Uh, and to do that is not a very humble approach, because you're assuming that you're better, you know better than this character. And I have to constantly remind myself that, uh, in fact, I don't know better than this character. Um, don't assume that you know better. I think a lot of comedy tries to uh, solve problems rather than simply present problems. I love this quote from uh, the playwright Anton Chekhov. There's a difference between the solution of the problem and the correct presentation of the problem. Only the latter is obligatory uh, for the artist. This is the idea that uh, if I'm improvising in an improvised Shakespeare show, it's very easy to presume that uh, a character is simply a bad person and I can tie a bow on that story by pointing out how bad of a person they are or having people learn very neat and tidy lessons as opposed to what improv is designed for, which is an exploration of a person's character. And so when we're exploring and ac accurately representing what makes people tick, we're doing them a service. We're doing the audience a service. When we are uh, moralizing and acting like we know better than a character, we're doing ourselves, the character, and the audience a disservice. Um, I like this idea from T.S. Eliot that the bad poet is one who is unusually unconscious where he ought to be conscious and conscious where he ought to be unconscious. So you can think of that in terms of when you're on stage improvising or doing whatever it is you're doing when you're creating, what are the things that you're conscious of? And we all know those moments where we are conscious of the things that we ought not to be conscious of. Um, we're trying to uh, win approval. We're trying to be better than our audience. We're trying to be better than our collaborator. We're trying to um, be ahead of the game versus living in the moment, trusting the people that we're on stage with, trusting our audience, and uh, above all, I think, trusting our, trusting our characters and having faith that, that they kind of uh, know what they're doing. Trusting the moment. For all of you uh, super nerds out there, in the Doctor Who universe, the most powerful uh, weapon of mass destruction is called the moment. Um, I think there's something you know, kind of profound about that, that uh, trusting in the moment is actually the most powerful thing that you can do, right? So don't be ahead of it. Don't be above them. Don't assume that you know better. In short, be humble. Um, my sort of uh, biggest new project right now is that uh, my wife and I uh, had a baby and we were uh, expecting our child and we both had this very strong intuition or, f or feeling that it was a girl and we started to uh, imagine our little girl, we picked out a name for her and we had no, it, it wasn't a, a preference, girl over boy, but it was just a, an intuition. And um, my family uh, has a, a history of doing this, like uh, knowing the gender of the baby before it's born. So we get excited about our little girl. We name her. We start to um, imagine what life will be like with her. Um, so my son was born on February 6th, <laughs> and he's 11 weeks old. And um, so it caused me to reflect on the improvised scene that is my life together with my son. The uh, very first thing that 
he did was uh, throw me a huge curveball and caused me to readjust my expectations. Um, having a boy or a girl, there's no, not one, one is not better than the other, right? It's just different from what I expected. And it was a, an awesome, humbling moment for me to realize and remind myself that um, as a parent, and I'm only 11 weeks into it, <laughs> <laughs> but this is the best advice that I can think of in an improvised world. Um, a, 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 a kid is a blank slate, you know, when they're first born, like an improv scene, right? And it's very easy to get ahead of it and to imagine that your child is going to like the same things that you like and that they're going to be a certain way. Um, and my training in improv reminds me to, uh, to trust the moment, that I, I don't know better who my son is than, than he is. So I look forward to spending the rest of my life letting him tell me um, and not to assume that, uh, that I know better than he does uh, who he is. I have to uh, not let my automatic mental GPS start plotting all the routes. People do it instantly, right? Like the, the kick, oh, he's going to be a soccer player. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so. Uh, those are my words of sem semi-wisdom for the morning as far as uh, improvisation uh, on stage and in life. Does anybody have any uh, questions? Thank you.